Speaker is Karol Zizkowski from Jagiellonian University. And also from Center for Theoretical Physics. And the physicist who, is, who didn't, uh, didn't belong to the Center of Theoretical Physics is like that. Yes. So, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure and honor to have a chance to talk. In fact, I'm a bit shy and intimidated, but I, do I get some tools yes, 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 yes. to be less shy and less intimidated? Ah, yes, there are my signs. I will talk about uh, uncertainty relations and wave functions, something typical and non-typical. But first, you will see the mm, room of Professor Igor Białynicki. And I was employed some 25 years ago. I was already not a young boy. I was already after a Humboldt a Fulbright habilitation. But every time I came to this office, I had a chance to ask some questions. Professor was very kind to me, allowed me to come to ask questions. But then I really felt shy. Look, nowadays you have chat GPT, you have Google. Those days, there was no good, but if I was asking something to myself, he always had a good answer. And it was for me incredible that he knows, in a sense, everything. And therefore, I was in fact scared that my ignorance would be revealed. So in some sense, I was pleased going back to my. And now I will start. You should read the inscription on this poster. Yeah. It said, I might, be wrong. I might have some faults, but being wrong is not one of them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to learn something about quantum, quantum theory from Professor Gielinski. And of course, you know, in the standard textbooks we learn about Heisenberg uncertainty relation. Sometimes students learn such an expression, you know, very well. Here, for simplicity, I put h bar equal to 1 to make it simpler. By the way, do you know in which European country children are used to age bar from the early childhood so they can appreciate quantum effects? You don't know? In Malta. They have to. Because there is age bar in the alphabet. You pronounce it like So they have to practice age bar every day from their childhood. But then this equation, you know, was in fact not given in the first paper by Heisenberg, Heisenberg used such a strange sign sim uh, wave, but it was by a less known scientist Kennard in the very same year. Then there is, you will know, a more general but state dependent bound of Robertson. We also teach our students. So you have here product of variances is larger than something expectation value of a commutator of two observables, and this is a more general but state dependent bound. Of course, it's easy to see that for momentum and position operators, uh, you know, computator, you get back the standard, the standard expression. And now, as you will guess, I will change the product of variance into sum of entropies. You know, entropy, very important function, was mentioned today a few times. And of course, you will know that there is a logarithm in this definition. And therefore, because we have logarithm instead of uh, working with product of variances, we discuss uh, sum of two entropies. And this is the setup for the infinite dimension Hilbert space. We have a continuous entropy, sometimes they're called Boltzmann and Gibbs. And it happens that if you sum two entropies of expansion of a given state in two bases, here is momentum and position, this bound, this quantity is bound. And of course, I refer to the very famous paper by Ivo Bialynicki, Mirula, and Jerzy Mycielski from 75. And it was a parallel paper by Beckner, I should quote. It was amazing for me to see that many, many years later, Professor Bialynicki, Mirula, in a sense, returned to similar problems. Then instead of standard entropies like shadow light, he considered a generalized family of rainy like entropies. And it took to 2006. Look how many years later he found new, new results. And now I'm very pleased that there are so many young people around. So now look, have you ever oops, thought about what will happen in 2071? I haven't yet. 
But look, also Gavinsky wrote his paper, Count How Many Years Ago. So I wish you the paper you will write this year will be quoted and discussed in 2071. <laughs> Please try. So those entropic uncertainty relations were formulated for infinite dimensional Hilbert space. But we can do a simpler thing. We can take n dimensional Hilbert space and take any state and expand it in two bases. Let's say eigenbases of two observable groups A and B, and then of course they are related by unitary matrix U I J. And you can define channel entropy in one basis. So PI are just squared expansion coefficients in the first expansion, QI in the second, mm -hmm. and you can check what happens with this sum of two entropies. And then it's interesting to again observe that those sum cannot be too small. And first interesting bound was found by Deutsch in 1983. So C is here the only parameter. It is the largest modulus of the entities of U. So you look, U is a unitary matrix. You compute absolute values, you look for the largest one, and uh, you get the bound. By the way, if C is equal to 1, this bound is useless because then it's 1 plus 1 is 2 over 2 is 1, log is 0, so this bound is, doesn't work if at least one entry of U is equal to 1. This bound was later improved by Massen and Ufik in 88, which is similar function of the same parameter C. And then I had the privilege to discuss problems like this with Professor uh, Ivo uh, many years later. And we are thinking, well, here they take only the largest entry of this matrix U. But maybe you can take the second largest or third largest or whatever. And then I will mention uh, a way to improve those bounds of mass and move. By the way, you take a standard Fourier matrix, Fn is now the n-dimensional Fourier matrix, you know, uh, of course, then this largest and the smallest mm, element have equal uh, moduli, is 1 over n, and then the mass and open relation is very simple, gives you sum of two entropies is a lock of n. n is the size of the given space. And of course, if state is in one basis has uh, eigenstate, so one coefficient is one, all others are zero, then this entropy is zero, and uh, then the bound is saturated, second entropy is maximum. And the same bound works not only for Fourier matrices, but in fact all other complex Hadamard matrices. They are matrices which consist of orthogonal rows and columns, but uh, entries are, uh, have arbitrary faces. So the question is how to improve those bounds of mass and UFI, they can be improved. And one option is basically, instead of looking for the largest element, you can look for the second largest or third largest, or you can take sub matrices, like minions of the matrix, look for the largest of size one, then the matrices of size, let's say two or two times three, and take norms of such blocks, take norms of those. So now SK is maximum of norms of such blocks of U. And then it is easy to show that SK is larger than SK uh, K minus 1, and you can define such coefficients RK. And here, this is the result from 2013 of the Bishop Puchawa and Lukasz Rodnicki, who is here. You can find the majorization relation. So you have two vectors, and the majorization relation implies that cumulative distribution function satisfying the quality, and then this implies a following bound. Look, the entropy of such a vector is just sum of two entropies. By the way, alpha is this Rayleigh parameter I already mentioned, also Jawinski was using uh, later on, and then we have the vector of numbers constructed of those norms SK, so Q is just this vector, and then it's possible to prove such a majorization relation, which implies an uncertainty relation, in fact, a full family of uncertainty relations for any Rayleigh parameter alpha. For alpha equal one, one gets just a new bound, which in some cases not always improves mass and open. Um, okay. Yes. There is 
also another option. Here, uh, before we use potential product of two vectors, here we can use sum, simple sum. So now the simple sum has norm two. In fact, we can divide it by two. And this is a sum of this uh, vector w of differences of those norms and one. And here, it happens, we're able to show a few years later, that this bound is stronger. So again, we have majorization relation, and this implies uh, another bound for sum of two entropies, given by the entropy of this number, which you can compute explicitly given concrete matrix of you. So here you just have such a picture. There's an orthogonal matrix, so just for a simple two case, case, you can check how it changes with theta, how those bounds work. And there were several other papers published in recent, recent uh, years. Well, here we discussed entropic ascertainability relation for some of entropies for a given unitary element. So of course, uh, the better bound than this, uh, we want to have this number as big as possible. But then you can ask a simple question. If you have a bound, what is very natural for a mathematician, also to physicist, if you have inequality? To ask the question, what are the objects, in this case quantum states, for which this inequality is saturated? For instance, for some bounds, entropic uh, ascertainability bounds, those states which do satisfy, do saturate the inequality are just famous coherent states, squeeze states, and so on. But in principle, such a question can be asked for any of such uncertainty relation. So in short, any such relation allows us to distinguish some very, very special states. Sometimes they have physical meaning, sometimes not. But they are non-typical. Because of course, if they satisfy such a, the here's equality, if they saturate inequality, they satisfy further constraints. So in a sense, they are from, they are non-typical. They form a set of, of measure zero. This is in the case of finite dimensional set of pure quantum states of size n, which is finite. By the way, have you ever thought, if we have, let's say, oh, let me use black box if possible, if we have an uh, interval from 0 to 1, we can take at random a point P, and we can think what will be the properties of such a, of such a number. For instance, we will know that such a number, if it's random, typical, generic, it will be unlikely to be a rational number with probability 1. This number will be irrational because the set of rational number has measured 0. So we know what's measured 0 provided the set has finite dimension. And now I will move to the second part of the talk. I will discuss quantum states with fractal properties. I'm sure you heard about fractal, but here I start with a very, very simple textbook problem. Basically, simplest question or exercise in quantum Theory is just take a point particle in an infinite potential well. So V of x, this potential, is equal to zero. For simplicity, I will assume that x belongs to zero to pi, and infinite as well. So we'll find such a problem in every textbook. And it looks like unlikely to find something interesting, because everybody studied such problems for many, many, many years. However, in mathematics, Clever people like Bayerstrass discuss some strange functions. Look, it's like given by an infinite series. And here, look, we sum over n. And OK, I bet to power n and sine a to power n. So it's a combination of signs. But in a sense, those components for high frequency that are <coughs> important, important, they become to uh, dominate. And then this function was shown to exhibit very strange, let's say, non-intuitive property. It is continuous everywhere. But it's nowhere differentiable. So in short, I'm not able to plot such a function because it is continuous but nowhere differentiable. I cannot even try to plot it because everywhere is not differentiable. 
and so, so this was known for more than one, 100 years. And then, in analogy to this function, one can take the famous Schrodinger equation, and then here a single line, so again h bar is set to, to uh, 1, but we are not at nighttime. And you know how the general uh, solution looks like. This is the general solution. And now you can choose on particles weights of those coefficients in such a way that basically, in analogy to Weierstrass function, those components with high frequency can dominate the behavior of such a function. So this is the explicit formula. So here, we have a function of x and t, space and time. S is a real number from 0 to 2, it's an important number. Q is fixed. I will get you like 2, 3, or 4. Let's have 2. M is the number of terms. And as you can guess, to get a mathematically rigorous fractal, what do you need? You need infinite energy. You need to take m to infinity, which of course in mathematics is easy to write m goes to infinity, but physically the frequency will go to infinity, so the energy will grow and the state will not be physical. So this is of course mathematically mm, eligible construction, a nice, nice uh, fractal, but in physics we can also study what happens with m's height. And you can guess what will happen. It will be a good approximation. The larger m, the better approximation to the real mathematical fractal, which reveals self-similarity for infinite um, space scales. And here I'm very pleased, maybe Professor Schleich will recall, I m mentioned the name of Carpet or quantum carpet. I know several papers of yours and also some of Professor Jawinicki. It's a good evidence that Professor Jawinicki had a great influence uh, upon us because we could uh, again learn, learn something from him. I think maybe you'll correct me. Professor Berry, uh, from Berry's face, he also had a paper with you, yes? About, uh, so the name was already known. So what is uh, quantum carpet? I recall as I first learned this name, I like it very much. Very simple. In the first year, we studied, maybe second of physics, we learned what is Fourier function. So we take probability, psi, as a function of xt squared absolute value. And we plot it. So this is a concrete example of this wave function where s is fixed like 3 over 2, q is fixed like 2, and m can go to infinity, but of course for practice, for a computer, m has to be finite. Here it occurs at only for m equal 20. It really looks nice, and I produce here the probability distribution P of xt is a surface, and then still it uh, displays fractal structure. Here is velocity, so dx over dt as a function of t. Here is cross-section of this uh, vertical or horizontal of this carpet. So probability as a function of space as a function of t. So four pictures, and for this particular choice of parameters, we could show that, for instance, um, the dimension of this so graph of velocity has dimension as a factor object, has dimension 5 over 4, space cross section has dimension 3 half, and the time dependence, okay, generically it has the factor dimension 7 over 4, but for certain Moments of uh, um, x, it can have smooth function of dimension 1. So more formally, we could show that in general case, or arbitrary s, we could compute that this two-dimensional object has dimension 2 plus s over 2, s is the single important parameter. Velocity uh, graph gives you the fractal object with dimension maximum of two numbers, one plus x uh, half or one, and similar for the space, for the space dimension. Well, those results were announced already in 2000 in the paper with Ivo Bialinitsky Biura. I was very pleased and lucky because of my name. I was the last one. So I have a privilege not only to work with Professor Bialinitsky, but once to be the last, but I would like to thank again Daniel Wojcik, who I hope is here, who was the first authoritative. Uh, yes, he's the majority, majority of the work. And just recently, inspired by invitation, 
O, acta fizyka Polonika. We managed to prove and to produce the proof of those statements. And I'm very pleased we can dedicate this article, which I hope is here. Yeah. To me. I hope it was, you know, it was, I think, officially, officially accepted. Because here, look, it is still vol XX, so I wasn't so sure. Yeah. Well, I think we will slowly go to conclusions, but first, I was mentioning that I used to be very shy in your office, which sometimes is true even now. But then I was uh, promising you I will mention what is the more mathematical definition of shyness. So, I discussed here uh, that if the sets are like integral, we know what is subset of measure zero, like rational numbers. If you draw numbers randomly, you, will, you have uh, zero probability to find such an object. So this is simple, if the set has finite dimension. And we understand this very well, so this example of irrational number, that they provide a set of measure zero is well known to us. However, the situation is more complicated if the set has infinite dimension. Why? Because the measure, is, there are problems who would define a nice measure in such a infinite dimensions. But mathematicians are clever, at least some of them. And I had a um, privilege to, again, learn something from clever people. And here, there is, maybe you know, a strange coincidence. Because the famous paper I quoted, it was by Ivo Bialinski, Bruna, and Jerzy Michelski. Mm -hmm. And here, I quote the paper by Jan Michelski, which I think is his distant, distant cousin, who used to work in Wrocław, and then moved to US. Boulder, Colorado was mentioned. So I had a privilege to visit Professor Michelski in Boulder, Colorado, many, many years ago. And he <coughs> wrote an important paper about those strongly mathematical paper about those issues. And then this name was the same year, 1992, introduced, you maybe know the important name of uh, James U. Hunt, Zauer, and York in 1992. And they, I think, introduced the name prevalence. So prevalence is like almost every for infinite dimensional spaces. And then the shy set is just complementary. So shy set is a set, mathematical set, which is a subset of space which is infinite dimensional, which in a sense is a generalization of measure zero. So in some sense, it's like every cross section, uh, at, uh, all those cross sections where you find this measure zero. And then Hunt already in 94 proved that the set of nowhere differentiable functions is prevalent in the set of continuous functions. So look, set of continuous function has infinitely many dimensions. It's a complicated set. As a physicist, we don't even try to understand the properties of this set. But then, strange thing happens that those differentiable functions, they form a very small set. How small? We don't know, but okay, mathematicians know in the sense, it satisfies this idea that the set of um, differentiable functions is shy, is small, and nowhere differentiable is prevalent or typical. So in a sense, for us, a simple observation, those fractal solutions, which are nowhere differentiable as the Weierstrass function, they are prevalent, so for us, generally typical in the set of all solutions. I think I will finish soon. It's okay, 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 so. But you see, it's already a good sign concluding the numbers. I want to remind you important papers by Professor Bialinski, Bula, concerning entropy, gas, and interrelations. And I will tell you that this research is still going on. People try to generalize those uh, results for infinite dimensional spaces, for finite dimensional spaces, for shallow entropies, for many entropies, for quantum states, for quantum measurements, for different setups. In quantum information, they work also on systems with quantum memory, and they get some interesting less or more results. But it's also interesting to study such distinguished quantum states, or maybe objects like quantum operations, which saturate those uncertainty relations. And here, I would like to emphasize that, OK, we are very pleased with typical properties, random matrices. We say oh, something is generic. I like generic properties. But in the physics, very often, the opposite is the case. So non-typical structures, or states, or objects, or solutions, 
are important and they play a key role in theoretical physics. And here, last part of concluding remarks, which is, goes in the same uh, spirit of typical and atypical uh, properties, I claim that there exists a non-generic and a very, very special element in the set of all Polish scientists. <laughs> and I will finish mentioning first photo by Andrzej Kobos, drogi panie profesorze, życzymy wiele, wiele, wiele lat w zdrowiu, w działaniu i mam nadzieję, że jak władze dziekańskie się zgodzą, chętnie bym się dał zaprosić za 10 lat, aby wspólnie świętować skórycie. No. Dziękuję bardzo. Czas na pytania. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. So for me, a very interesting lecture, but I didn't capture two elements which troubled me. The one is that the state in physics is usually obtained by solving some dynamic equations, and I couldn't see this. And second, is that when I evaluate entropy, I usually cross grain. So I lose information, while it seems that you are digging deeper into information. So Thank you, yes, great question. So I will try to go back uh, quickly. Uh, concerning critical equation, we have an equation, and then we can look for a set of all solutions. So of course here, I do not yet specified um, boundary conditions. Uh, and then we can, okay, technically it's a so-called weak solution, but if you plug in this equation, this solution, into the Schrodinger equation, you can easily check that it works. And here, the second, basically, this is the dependence on time. So, so, really so, so in a sense, in, in short, in the set of all possible solutions, I study such, various, they look like strange. But they are solutions of Schrodinger. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, Kioski. Kioski will uh, correct. What about uh, Cosgrave? Yeah, but maybe I will ask Professor Kioski who can <laughs> be puzzled by, this, by your statement that a uh, theorem about prevailing uh, non differentiable functions um, comes from uh, 1980 something because. Uh, when I was student of the first year, I was told that this was exactly the case, but in, in, the, in the sense of bare categories. Mm -hmm. And we were even trained to prove this theorem at the end of uh, my first year studies here at this university. So I will return to your question soon, but in short, this is of course true because bare categories, but as far as I'm uh, informed, those papers and this idea of prevalence, which was strictly mathematically explained and was for physicists explained as a generalization of the set with measure one or measure zero, was only done in the 90s, early 90s. And I was studying at 60, 61. Okay, but perhaps in a big different form and a different uh, yes, uh, assumptions. And, and you have been studying at faculty of physics. Yes. <laughs> okay, and uh, turning to another question. So look, we have a state and we represent it in two different bases. So cross grain, good question, it's already done in a sense because I project the state onto eigenstate i of a, or the later, eigenstate, let's say, beta j of b. So the cos gaming in a sense is here, because I take those probabilities, so cos gaming is here, and compute two, in this case, Shannon entropies for this expansion, and for this expansion, and establish some of those. So, as you see, cos gaming is done here, in this place. For the question. Can I ask a uh, follow-up question? Because uh, those state that you have chosen about the first question, that there was q equal to 2, 3, and so on and so on. So this was integer. But uh, what will happen if it will not be integer? Because then it will not be a solution of the Yes, yes, yes. OK. So on purpose, OK, good question. But as you see, it is like cooking recipe. So of course we took on purpose uh, q, which is uh, to look to produce such equations. 
Uh, but maybe uh, my co-author first. Let us ask first author of the paper. Maybe he will have a better, yeah. uh, better um, explanation. Thanks, Daniel. Yes. Yeah, so just. It doesn't matter, as long as Q is you know, bigger than 1, I think you can get a fractal. But you need integers in this case to satisfy the bounded conditions. Yes. It's, a, it's a fixed one, you can, you can see, you know, that's it goes from 0 to 5. Yeah, that's what I understood, that's why I asked the question. No, no, I mean, it's just that if you do not take an integer, you will not satisfy the boundary conditions. But we actually have a very more general, like, more general result for, for also for other Hamiltonians where you can analyze can this condition. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next slide. I will give you the mic. Please. I'm still chewing on, I'm still chewing on this answer you gave to, to Jan. To Jan. Uh, if I understand correctly, this was just a one single state, right? It's not an entangled state. Right? No, no, no. The one single state for n dimensional Hilbert space. So in a sense, okay, the matter of taste, how you call it, call it, call it, call it, call it. But what, 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 what's it? Yes, here. So, 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 yeah. so you're talking about some value SA of some operator and some value SB of some other operator in the same state. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, okay, so I would have thought it's more like what I learned from Evo, it's, it's the area in phase space, so to speak, right? That you're looking at. It's not so, something like an entropy, but you're using a measure that has to do with the logarithm. Yes, so look, of but course, it is a Hamel entropy, which is used in a sense instead of variance to yeah. measure the, uh, let's say, uncertainty or uh, width of the wave function. And in a sense, it's similar, like, Kennard Heisenberg expression, yeah. but you, in entropic terms, sometimes this approach is more uh, useful. And here we are pleased to see kind of relation to the earlier paper by Ivo okay. in the different setup. All I wanted to say is I would agree with Jan that there is no coarse graining in this problem. That's for my that was my statement. Mm -hmm. it's, this is a discrete case, so this is very hard to say. Further questions, comments, critics? No. Let me finish. Let us.